Jesus in this place. You are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of every whisper today. You are worthy of every shout today. God, you're worthy of it all. And we give every incense. Worship is our incense. Prayers are our incense. Our posture is our incense. Our lives are the incense that we give to you. Let it arise to you today. Oh, we love you, God. We love you, Jesus. Can you behold him tonight? Let him just touch your heart tonight. Let him touch your mind tonight. But let him be adored tonight. Thank you, Lord. We love you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm so grateful to see many people coming out for Good Friday. And I also want to welcome our first time guests here in the house. Thank you, friends and family who have come to be with us today. And for those online as, as well, we thank you. For being with us is a good day it's called Good Friday for a reason I'm gonna start today by just taking us to the scriptures if you have your Bible today we're just gonna open up to the book of John chapter 19 if you don't bring your Bible that's a-okay it's gonna be on the screen would you go with me as we read about the Savior? So Pilate then took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and put a purple cloak on him. And they repeatedly came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapped him in the face again and again. And then Pilate came out again and said to them, See, I am bringing out to you so that you will know I find no grounds at all for charges in his case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. We're going to skip down to verse 16. So then he handed him over to be crucified they took Jesus therefore and he went out carrying his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Hebrew is called Golgotha there they crucified him and with them two other men one on either side and Jesus in between now Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross as it was written Jesus the Nazarene the king of the Jews. Let's go to verse 26. So when Jesus saw his mother, he's now on the cross, and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished in order that the scripture would be fulfilled said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What we're doing here today is we're going to meditate on what Jesus did on Good Friday. I want us to really fix our eyes on the cross because you know that the world, the flesh, and the devil does everything to try and fix our eyes away from the cross and what Jesus has done. So today, we're going to, tonight, we're going to meditate on the cross. We are going to fix our eyes on this precious symbol because this symbol right here is a symbol of your deliverance. This is actually a symbol of Satan's defeat. So tonight, we're going to process some of what happened on Good Friday. 
What we just read was Pilate, Some, many of you are familiar with the story, but this leader said, I find no fault in him. There is no wrong in this man. He declared him innocent before the religious leaders and the people. But from there, because there was so much mounting pressure on Pilate, he had him scourged, or other words, flogged. And there's a suggestion that's, that is believed that Pilate was hoping if, if, if Jesus had an incredible beating, then when he would bring him out again, the religious leaders would be satisfied and that would be it. But we know that's not it. Actually, to be uh, crucified, you must first, the law was to be scourged or flogged. But here's what I want you to know as we ponder about our Savior tonight. Is that they would take the criminal, in this case they would take Jesus, and they would strip him naked. They would have him fastened to a stump. And then they would begin to do the scourging with an instrument, many known as cat o nine tails. And what that is, is a whip with leather strands. And on the leather strands were bone and were metal. So when that whip was flung against Jesus, what would happen there is that metal, that bone, would not only do a deep bruising, but in that moment it would grab a hold of the flesh. And when the soldier would bring back the whip, it would tear into his muscle, making his muscle like ribbons. The flesh torn and now bone is being exposed. It's actually not unusual that one would die from a scourging. But the soldiers didn't just beat him, they took it to a whole nother level. What they did with him, let, I, let me remind you, is that they, they mocked him. You see, what they did was they blindfolded him. And they began to take turns with a right hook punch one after the other after the other. And they said, while he was blindfolded, tell us which one of us hit you. And then from there, they would tear out his beard. And then if that wasn't bad enough, a soldier came and, and twisted a, and made a crown of thorns with those thorns being an inch to two inches long. And then they would take the sticks and they would push it down into his skull, creating puncture wounds. And those puncture wounds would be in those sensitive places where a lot of blood would gush. But not only that, those puncture wounds where those thorns are going in would hit a nerve, causing nerve pain to go throughout his head and down his neck. From there, they found a purple robe. And they thought it was a good idea to mock him further. And they put this purple robe around him. They put a reed in his hand and they began to say, Hail, King of the Jews, and pretend to bow to him. And What that actually, that robe did though, was it caused the blood to clot, kind of like a bandage, so that, that profuse bleeding slowed down. And there was clotting happening, but as they were mocking him and with that robe on, what they did was then they ripped off the robe and it tore open fresh again, those wounds. And the bleeding would begin to flow again. What about those soldiers? I mean, have you ever thought, how many times did they brag about what they did to Jesus? How many times did they recount the story of their part that they played. And then what happens 
is that Jesus is now unrecognizable. The Bible says that he is unrecognizable as a human being. Why? Why does, does he look like this? Why? And it's because sin looks like this. Sin disfigures your life. Sin smells like death. It looks like death. It tastes like death. And sin will always seek to steal your identity. Why does he look like that on Good Friday? Because he was bearing the weight of the curse of sin of yours and mine and of all mankind on him. So then he gets paraded down the street and then he gets, as you think about it, as he's paraded down the street, how much blood is still flowing from his body down the streets? And I know I've walked some of those streets in Israel and to know that Jesus' blood was once sprinkled or flow, flowed there. And then he was taken and put on a cross. Crucifixion. I want you to take a moment. I know a lot of people are here, but if you just take a moment, I know I've been saying a lot of words, but see the innocent Lamb of God on the cross. I want you to see him hanging there, his hands and his feet, they are outstretched and they're nailed. He's being crucified. What is crucifixion? Well, first, we know that it was invented by the Persians, but it's said that it was perfected by the Romans, meaning that they made it even worse than it was originally intended. See, it was a slow death, and the death on a cross, death by crucifixion, would take anywhere from 36 hours to nine days. Then a man would hang there. A slow death. And it's painful because what is happening is fluid, is building up in the lungs, causing this human being to drown and to suffocate. Crucifixion is possibly the worst painful death ever invented. Do you know that word excruciating that we use in our English language? excruciating, when we like to tell someone how bad something was for us. It was excruciating. But do you realize that that English word is derived from the word crucifixion? Because when you use that word excruciating, pointing back to the crucifixion, what you're trying to convey is that you're acknowledging it was a painful and drawn out suffering. I want you to think about this. As he was nailed, we, we think about, okay, his hands were nailed. But do you realize they stretched out his arm further than it was supposed to ever go? And they would stretch out the other arm. And what is happening is his shoulders and his elbows are being dislocated in that moment. And then they take his wrists and they take the nails and pierce him. But do you understand what's happening in that moment? Jesus with his dislocated body is fulfilling scripture from the Old Testament that was spoken of about a thousand years earlier. A messianic prophecy from Psalm 22, 14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. As Jesus is hanging there, what's happening is the body weight is pulling down on his diaphragm. Air is moving into his lungs, but it can't escape. Only by one way can it escape, and that is by pulling up on his nailed feet and by his wrists. It is painful to breathe 
one single breath at a time. So let me think about this for a moment. With every exhale, it causes another level of pain. But do you remember when Jesus was on the cross? He wasn't quiet on the cross. He spoke. He spoke seven different things on the cross. If you think about it, Jesus was preaching in that moment because it must have been so painful to speak out those words one word at a time. So if speaking was so painful, then we must pay attention to every word that he uttered on that day. Think about how painful it must have been for him to even utter, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A whole nother level of pain. If I knew it was gonna cause me pain, I would have been silent. I would have saved myself the trouble. And I definitely would not have said forgive them. But he doesn't stop there. He's hanging on the cross for quite a long time. And I want you to hear his labored speech. I want you to hear the gurgling of his lungs that are being drowned. I want you to hear him try with all the energy he can muster to speak the rest of these words. Speaking to the thief next to him, he would say, today you will be with me in paradise. Then thinking about his mother, he'd say to his mom next to the disciple, woman, behold your son. And then to the disciple, behold your mother. And then the agony of separation from his father, knowing what it is to be completely separated. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And next, on these long hours, he would then get to the point where he says, I thirst. After he's given something, then he says, it is finished. And it seems to be that what he says next is right after it is finished, and that is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Tonight, I want us to just pause and take some time on two words, two sayings that he said. The first one that I want us to take time on is, I thirst. Just one word in, word in the Greek, dipso, which is actually what happens when one is being crucified, that's a result of crucifixion, is a severe dehydration. So Jesus has already lost a lot of fluids in this moment, and now his brain is signaling an emergency. This needs to be fixed right now. Now he's near the end. He's, he's right near the end. He's been on the cross for about six hours, and now he is dealing with a tormenting thirst. I thirst. Think about it. I thirst. Such a human statement. Such a human experience. But also at the same time, it's divine. Why is it divine? Because here it says back in verse 28, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, then he said, I thirst. Because what was happening in that moment was once again, 
he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy from about a thousand years earlier from Psalm 69, 21, which says, they offer me sour wine to satisfy my thirst. When he said, I thirst on the cross, he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. He was expressing that he is human, yet he is the Messiah, yet he is divine. I thirst. If you think about it, the last time he probably drank was at the Last Supper. And then he was there at the Garden of Gethsemane where the dehydration actually began because he was there with agony, sweating, blood. But if you remember, the first time he was offered wine, he refused it. Why did he refuse the first time, but not the second time? The first time he was offered wine, the Bible tells us that this wine had gall in it. And what is gall? It was a numbing agent. What it would do is, it was dull some of the pain that, that Jesus was experiencing, but he refused it because Jesus did not want to numb the intensity of your payment and my payment. He surrenders himself to drink the cup of all of the wrath, to drink the cup of all of the agony, of separation from God. He tasted hell so you don't have to. A substitutionary death is what this was. He took what we deserved. And then he gave us what he deserved. He gave you his righteousness. And so as he takes a drink and sucks it up from that sponge as it touches his cracked lips, he's drinking in just enough moisture to utter a word that is a word that has changed, changed the history of all time. It is one word that he spoke after drinking enough moisture to say it. One word that has the power to change history, then, now, and today. We have it as three words. It is finished. But I am telling you, the Bible was not written in English. Actually, what would be used here is not three words, but one word. One word in Greek. And this one word is the why for the cross. The one word the, is the answer to the problem of all mankind. Walk back with me to the cross. Think about this for a moment. He drank just enough to be able to say this. And never in all time was this one word uttered from a man hanging on a cross. Why would our Savior take the effort to say this one word? I want it to pierce your ears. I want it to pierce your ears as if you're hearing it from Jesus on that day to tell us die. To tell us die. Do you know that every single person around in earshot of the cross heard him say to tell us die? And each and every single one of them knew exactly what it meant. But why would this man say to tell us die in this moment? What does it mean? I want to give you two distinct meanings, and we already said the one, it is finished, but the second one is paid in full. 
So for this Greek word, to tetelestai, we have to first understand the tense that it was spoken in. Now we, as majority of us, English our first language, maybe some of you second language or third. But English, we're so used to using past tense, like it is finished. We put an ED on to say it's something that happened in the past. We're used to using present tense, which means it's happening in the moment. And we're used to future tense, speaking of it will happen in the future. But this word in the Greek is actually a Greek perfect verb tense. Now don't don't get tired on me. But it's important to understand the tense which he used in that moment. A Greek perfect perfect verb tense. Why do I say that? I want everyone to listen. To use to tell us die in the perfect verb tense is to say this action was completed in the past but still has effect on the present. When you use this tense, it's saying that something that was done in the moment continues on for the future with ongoing results with no end. Which means it's just as real today as it was 2,000 years ago when he spoke out to tell his side. It was paid in full then it is paid in full today and is paid in full forever it is finished then it is finished today and it is finished tomorrow this word to tell us I speaks for you today and in that moment he was evoking this perfect verb tense to let you know it still has power. It will never, ever lose its power. If you think about these people all around, they're like, why is to tell a sigh because they knew exactly what it meant in his time and how it was used. So let's just take a few moments and go back and, and see how it was used. Where we would first hear it used if someone had a debt and they were paying it and paying it and paying it little by little like a, like a layaway. Remember Kmart layaway? And when that, that person, that debtor, would finally pay the last bit of that debt, the creditor would then get a stamp and stamp to tell us I. It's paid in full. You may have it. It's all yours. It's been paid in full. So what is Jesus saying is that Jesus is saying, I have paid your debt of sin. It is paid in full. Nothing else. Listen to me. Nothing else is owed by you because I paid it in full. Another way it was used was in a military term. When there was a war and the war finally came to an end and one country had a victory and they would shout out to tell us die, it is finished and we have the victory. They would put up flags declaring this is our property, this is our territory. We won the battle. So what is Jesus saying 
When he says to Telestai, he is saying, I have won the battle against evil. I have won the battle against sin. I have won the battle against death. I have won the battle against hell. I have won the battle against the grave. I have won the battle against sickness. I have won the battle over depression. I have won the battle over your life. It is finished. And you, and you, and you have a victory. This word that Jesus spoke, it's so beautiful, there's more to it. Another way it would be used is if a master spoke to a servant and said, I I want you to do this today, this today, this today, this today, and this today, and this today. And the servant would go amongst his day and he would do one task at a time. He would complete that task. He would complete that task. And then he would be able to come back to his master and say, to tell a sty, the work you gave me to do is finished. Oh, some of you aren't understanding what I'm laying down yet. What Jesus is saying in that moment is he's going to his father and he's saying, I have finished everything you have sent me to do. To tell a sigh. Oh. And if you think about it, every single prophecy concerning his first coming was completed. To tell a sigh. And then next, it'd be used in a business transaction, transaction where there would be selling and buying a property. It would be when there was a transfer of property that they would get the deed out that said, you have bought this property from me and it is now yours. They would sign it and stamp it and stamp it to Telestai. You have bought this property and now it belongs to you. What is Jesus saying? I have purchased you with my blood. You have been bought with a price. You have been bought with a price and your life is paid in full to tell a side. Not over. A Hebrew priest when it was time for a sacrifice, and he'd have a lamb. He would need to inspect that lamb to make sure there was no flaws on this lamb. No sickness, no disease, everything was perfect. And when he would find that the lamb, the sacrifice was perfect, that the sacrifice was worthy, he might say, to Telestai, which means, The sacrifice is worthy. And I want you to know that Jesus would not be able to say in that moment to tell a sigh unless he knew that the sacrifice of his life had been received by the Father. To tell a sigh. Just a couple more. If you think about an artist, what they would know in this time is that for the artists around town, when they would paint a painting or sculpt something, that artist would look at that sculpture. They'd examine it. And they would see it's perfectly perfect. Nothing needs to be added to this. They'd make a painting And they'd see, it's exactly what I dreamt of and what I had hoped it to be. Don't touch it. Nothing needs to be done. It is finished. It is perfectly perfect. And then the artist would say, with excitement, 
to Telestai. It is completely perfect. Nothing needs to be added to it. It is acceptable just the way it is. And someone needs to hear today, you do not need to add anything to what Jesus has already done. He completed it perfectly perfect to tell a side. And I can imagine him writing the painting making the painting of this whole story from the beginning of Adam and Eve and seeing it into this moment and then to the resurrection and him just seeing that the masterpiece is complete. Nothing needs to be changed. Nothing needs to be added. And then lastly, it would be used in a court system in the court system, when someone would say to tell us I would, it would mean that a sentence was fully served. When a sentence was fully served, they would say to tell us I. But here's what you need to know about history was that when a criminal was found guilty, there would be a certificate of debt that would be written about what he has done, everything that he has done, and what is the penalty. And then that criminal would be placed into jail. And then that certificate of debt would be nailed on the door of that prisoner. That prisoner's jail cell. And every time someone would walk by, they can see what he's guilty of, what she's guilty of. And it would speak to this person's shame. It would speak to this person's penalty. But the incredible thing is for the prisoners that had to just serve time, what would happen is they would, in the court system, have that document that lists everything that criminal has done to be guilty. They've been in jail for seven years now. It's time. And they would have it taken down and they would give it to the judge. And the judge would sign it and then the ju judge would stamp it, saying your time was paid in full to Telestai. And that once criminal could now say, I am a criminal no longer because the sentence has been paid in full. When Jesus on that Good Friday took your pain and he took your sin upon himself, he said, you come out, I go in. And he served the time that you were supposed to serve, the death that you were supposed to die. And he paid it. And when he spoke to Telesai, he was giving you something that you can say when the accusers try to come your way, when your mind tries to play tricks on you. Jesus said to tell a sigh, not guilty. No longer does it need to be paid for because Jesus paid it all. Never again, never again could you be tried in court for it. And I just think there's some people that need to be reminded it's been paid in full. It's been paid in full. There's some people that need to be reminded 
that you don't have to pay for it. It's already been paid. There's some people that need to remind, be reminded that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's people that need to rem be reminded that sin has no power over you. There's people that need to be reminded that Jesus does not see your sin. He sees the blood to tell a sign. Some need to be reminded that when it comes to Jesus, he is the curse breaker. Every curse that has been passed down in your family was broken when you said yes to Jesus to tell a sign. Every sin that you have confessed has been paid for in full to tell a sign, to tell a sign, to tell a sign, to tell a sign. Come on, who needs this? Come on, let's go. Let's go. To tell a sigh. Come on, sweetheart. To tell a sigh. I want you to hang this over with your friends. Come on. To tell a sigh. As we get ready to close, I'm going to have the worship team come on up. I want to remind you, Jesus paid for your life. He paid for your debt of sin. He paid for your death. And as we go to our last scripture for tonight, I want us to go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And it says, And when you were dead, you realize we all had the same autopsy results. You were spiritually dead without Christ. When you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive. I was once dead, but now I'm alive. Together with him, having forgiven us all our, our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of debt, having canceled it, That thing that which was hostile towards you and towards me, he's taken it out of the way. It no longer stands between you and God. He took it out of the way and he has nailed it to the cross. It's there. It's not on you anymore. You don't have to carry it anymore. He took it all. He paid it in full to tell his side. And I know that there's some people who are want to feel like you have to take it down. But how dare we try to take it down? You could never pay this debt. That's why Jesus paid it for you. Will you stand to your feet? As we're closing, I want you to hear there is a better word that's spoken over to you, to you, to tell us, Sai. It is finished, paid in full. To tell us, Sai. Let's speak of a better word that Jesus spoke. Can we worship him tonight? Let's worship. can wash away my guilty stains after all the wrong I've done I've already tried a thousand ways 
But it's never been enough What can be enough? Nothing but the blood A better word was spoken Oh, I know it was Nothing but the blood Every curse was broken Spoken. Oh, I know it was nothing but the blood. Every curse was broken. Oh, I know it was nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. I'm reminded of my shame To the fountain I will run Every failure covered now by grace When your lamb is overcome What can overcome? Nothing but the blood was broken Oh, I know it was nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood Come on, on that cross On that cross Hallelujah I left my shame where the nails were
spoken. Oh, I know it was nothing but the blood. Every curse was broken. Oh, I know it was nothing but the blood. Yeah. A better word was spoken. thankful for the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Okay, let's go to be seated. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to receive communion together. If you did not pick up the elements as you came through the doors today, just put your hands in the air. Our ushers will be very glad to go ahead and get a packet to you. And just keep your hands up. We promise we're better than dominoes. We will get it to you in under 30 minutes, under 30 seconds, hopefully. Right here, this, this way. Any way you slice it, it's really good. But as we're doing that, if you're new to receiving communion here, uh, we have it all in one packet. The first layer pulls off very easily for the wafer. Second one's a little harder, so we just recommend pull it back enough to drink from it. Don't try and wrestle it off because your arm could end up in your neighbor's face and then... There's got to be all this forgiveness that's offered before you receive the communion so you don't do it with offense, you know, all that. But in all seriousness, how many appreciate just that beautiful breakdown? Come on, by Pastor Dana, it's just yeah, absolutely wonderful. So there's nothing I need to recount about the cross. I just think it's, I, I love the way it, you set it up, Pastor Dana, saying that in the midst of all this, I mean, a after the whipping post where most men die, and yet he's still alive, and yet he's endured the extra things like the crown, the punches, the ripping of the robe off his back, and yet he has the wherewithal in his mind to summon the strength to utter the things, including te telestai, te telestai. So what I want to focus on very briefly is what Jesus said and how he previewed this when he had that Passover meal with his disciples. The Gospels record, it says that Jesus took the bread. It says he gave thanks. And then he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Here, eat partake of this it says in the same manner he gave what thanks and he took the cup and said this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness what of sins and the reason I, I say that is it shows us that when he went here one he gave thanks and then he broke it Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I've been here on mission. I've been walking towards this place. And no man, no enemy, there's no wisdom, insight, or plan that can succeed against the wisdom of God being, in reveal, being revealed. Because after I'm done, it will be written, had the principalities and powers known what they were doing, they never would have seen that I got here. But you see, I'm greater and I'm God all by myself. And I love my creation. And even though sin has separated, I'm going to come and destroy the work of sin, its creator. I'm going to destroy death itself. I'm going to go into the grave. And so I give thanks. And so if you have that way for break it, and know that he gave thanks to break his body on these wooden beams. He gave thanks so that we could tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake of his body together.
this cup, this blood, Tay Celestai, applying to the past, the present, and the future. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is our great high priest. The high priest would offer the sacrifice for the entire nation. And so when he was on these beams and he was saying, Father God, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was in a different tense. He kept repeating it. Why did he keep repeating it? It was in the imperfect tense is what it is. It means he kept repeating, Father God, forgive them. Father God, forgive them. Why? Because he's the sacrifice one time for all time. So this means that he was staring into the past saying, Father God, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was looking at those betraying him in the present saying, Father God, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was looking into the future long before you and I were even born. And he would see our shortcomings, our sins, and our failures. But when we put our trust in him, he's already uttered the words, Father, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How many are thankful for the blood of Jesus that wipes away your sin and my sin? Lord, thank you. You gave thanks to spill out your blood to forgive us and wipe away our sins and make us righteous. You got what we deserved. And we got what we didn't deserve, your grace, your righteousness, your unmerited favor, love, and kindness. And we receive it today in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. We bless the Lamb of God. We bless the Lamb of God. How precious, how precious, how precious. I'm going to ask everyone, you stand to your feet. I know the buckets will come by. You can drop the rest of the communion parts in there. Listen, we're about to sing, and we're going to close service here in just a moment. But before we do, I want everyone to bow their heads, because I, I, I just know that tonight that there's people in here and there's people online. Listen, this isn't, this isn't a religious holiday. This is where we take into account the beauty of what was done one time for all time. And the message of this day is no matter how far away from God you are, and as deep and as dark as your sin and my sin may go, there's a man who went down deeper to see it uprooted, to see it pulled out, to see us restored so that we can be like that person carrying around that certificate. When somebody tries to grab us and talk to us about our past, that there's an opportunity for us to turn around and say, paid in full. So I want us to bow our heads right now. I wonder how many here would say, Pastor, I need the Jesus that was talked about tonight. Pastor, I am so far away from him. I've bought into every lie that my sins can't be forgiven. Maybe you've never actually even embraced Jesus at all. Maybe you came in tonight as a courtesy to somebody. You did not expect your heart to be invaded by the love of God. I want to encourage you, your sins can be forgiven tonight. You can be made righteous in God's eyes through receiving his son. So I'm I'm about to pray a prayer. If you want to pray with me, if that's you, I want you to pray with me. Because the Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. That means forgiven and made righteous. You have tetelestai all prophesied over your life. So if that's you and you want to pray online or right here, let's do that right now with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you are God's son. You died my death. Your blood was spilled for my sins. Forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. I receive what you did on the cross. And I also say, three days later, you rose from the dead. You have power over death. And because you're alive, I'm alive. And you live in me. In Jesus' name. Now listen, why when heads bowed, if you know you needed to pray with me, I'm going to give you a moment to have your moment with God right here. 
I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if you pray with me. I'm going to count to three. I'll give you to a three, but you don't got to wait until I get to three. You can start right now. Come on, how many? That was you. I already see. Yep, one. Come on, Pastor, that was me. I was praying with you. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Two. Yep, Pastor, that was me. Yep, yep. Three. Pastor, that, that was me. I needed to pray. I needed to pray. I needed to pray. Okay, you can put your hands down. Church, let's put our hands together online. Come on, let us know if you prayed. Come on, in the house of the Lord, in His presence. Beautiful, beautiful Lord. Now, listen, if, if you just prayed and you came with somebody, let them know, hey, that was me. That was me. I, I, I had to pray. If you don't have a church, if this is all brand new to you, and you want to be in a place where everybody else comes out of a jacked up background, messed up by sin, but we're gathered around the perfect God who uttered these words on the cross, then these doors are open to you anytime you want. Welcome to the home of everybody who's been jacked up, but God's transforming us by the power of his blood, making us more like him. He's the center of our worship. But if you know there's a place, that there's a church maybe that you were a part of that you know, like, no, Pastor, that's where I'm supposed to go, then God bless you, go. But gather with God's people and allow Jesus to change you. Come on, have we received God's word? Have we received his ministry here this evening? I'm going to close this in prayer. If you want to stay and sing, the worship team is going to sing a song, right? If you want to stay, you can. But thank you for being here. Sunday, we got three services, 830, 1015, 12 o'clock. And you never know what's going to happen, right? So we encourage you, bring someone, bring family, bring friends. This is actually, you can kidnap somebody. It's, it's okay on Sunday. Just bring them right. Just kidding. Just kidding. But let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful time in your presence. Jesus, when we look at the cross, we're reminded of what we did. And we're reminded that you stood in our place. And it was your love for us that actually held you to those wooden beams. Thank you for what is what was so awful has become the most beautiful and precious thing that any human being could ever behold. In Jesus' name we pray, we say amen. Amen, amen, and God bless you. Go in the grace of God here on Good Friday.